I am so delighted to be here. It's really, it's really a treat. Uh, I'm kind of doing a time travel thing because I was here ten and a half years ago with uh, the uh, Fourth International Mind Dreamtime Festival. So it's funny how memory, you have memory stored in the back of your mind and you revisit spaces that you've been to before. And uh, sometimes it doesn't match your memory cells, but uh, new memories are being made all the time. So uh, I appreciate the invitation and uh, thank you all for being here. It's, it's exciting to be able to share the latest breakthroughs and developments and what's going on with this uh, this uh, 2012 topic, and of course we're getting closer and closer and closer. And I will be kind of giving a, a, a broad summary of some things, and because the theme is uh, megaliths, <clears throat> I wanted to sort of make some broad outlines of some of the megalithic structures that are found in the Western Hemisphere, uh, and there's a lot of them. And so it's, it's amazing the concentration of megalithic structures here uh, in the UK and, and Brittany and elsewhere uh, in Europe and so on. And, you know, the ancient people of the Western Hemisphere were doing similar things at similar times. So I'll sketch that a little bit and then I'll be getting into uh, the Maya material and uh, sharing uh, what my work has been about. Um, I sort of have this uh, strange uh, affliction that I, I kind of have always believed that uh, 2012 should be about trying to understand what the ancient Maya thought about 2012. And of course, as, as anybody that spent any time with 2012 in the Google sphere knows, uh, 2012 has become sticky paper for a lot of uh, crazy ideas. And uh, so, I've been interested in that, you know, I've been interested in, in sort of uh, uh, shedding light on the various manifestations of uh, 2012 in the, in, in the popular marketplace. There's many theories and systems and models that people are putting out there. There's also, of course, the whole reactionary doomsday survivalist uh, groups of people uh, that are going to the bank selling gas masks and so on. And then, of course, I've always been interested in what the professional Maya scholars have been thinking and saying about 2012, because what I am really attempting to do is to just engage in a good old-fashioned reconstruction about what the ancient uh, Maya people were thinking about this date. And uh, I've had good results over the last uh, 15, 20 years. And unfortunately, the professional Maya scholars haven't really been paying attention uh, in fact, uh, they've been sort of in this reactionary relationship with a lot of the far extreme goofball ideas in the marketplace. And so basically, for all this time, the professional Maya scholars have not been engaging seriously with 2012 at all. In fact, I like to say that uh, professional Maya scholars never dropped the ball on seriously addressing what 2012 meant to the ancient Maya. They never picked the ball up. So uh, things are changing in that area, though. I have to say there's been some breakthroughs recently, and there's a couple of progressive Maya scholars who are starting to take a serious look at uh, 2012, especially with the advent of this uh, uh, Tortuguero Monument 6 inscription. Uh, this is a very important monument for understanding the 2012 question and how the ancient Maya thought about 2012, because it's really the only classic period inscription that has the 2012 date on it. So it's very exciting. It's come to light just in the last five years or so. And I'll be getting into that a little bit. In fact, that's where a lot of the breakthroughs have been happening. Um, uh, you know, not a lot of people were aware of that inscription until about five years ago. I wasn't aware of it. My work in the 90s proceeded from asking the question, where was the long count calendar invented? Who? when. And following the advice of the Maya scholar Michael Coe, um, it appears that the long count calendar was invented at this early Maya site called Izapa. So that's where my uh, research proceeded from in the mid-90s and I came to a conclusion about what the Maya thought about it and uh, it's all coming full circle very nicely now with the information that we see on the Tortuguero monument and we'll be getting into that a little bit. 
Who am I? Well, I am an independent researcher. I confess I belong to the autodidacts out there, and uh, I don't have a degree. And, uh, but that's a good thing, because it means that I can say progressive things without the fear of getting fired. And, uh, but what I like to say is that the work that I'm really doing in understanding ancient Maya cosmology is really the work of archaeoastronomy. You know, it's that, it's that, uh, it's like an interdisciplinary synthesis. It's like an integration of archaeology and astronomy, but there's a lot of other things that come into that, come into play. You know, it's, uh, there's iconography, you've got pictograms and uh, symbols, you also have the calendar and how it works, you've got linguistics, you've got uh, the, uh, the sacred space that you find a site, like Izapa, for example, is an amazing site that's oriented to the volcano to the north and it's got the solstice alignment that way. So there's that sense of space and I think that's where the study of the megaliths uh, that are going on everywhere uh, share these sort of like common elements where it's important to go to these places and, you know, grok the space, imbibe the space. And I think it's really only through having that experiential connection and relationship with some of these sites that one can really develop uh, an understanding, you know, like a direct, uh, a direct knowing uh, in terms of what the ancient people were, were thinking about that space. Um, and, you know, a lot of my work has been motivated by my travels among the Maya going back to the mid-1980s. Uh, early on in my work, I was uh, kind of more interested in the political goings-on. I mean, that was the time of the genocides and the death squads, and that's kind of how I broke into writing. I was writing some travel pieces uh, on, the, on the politics and the death squads in Guatemala uh, for a, a small newspaper uh, that my brother was publishing in Chicago. And so everything kind of unfolded from there and I got more interested in the, uh, in the calendar and the uh, teachings and the ancient Maya world. Of course, I was visiting all the temple sites while I was traveling and everything. So I came to be uh, uh, an investigator of the ancient site of Izapa, which is very important for understanding the 2012 question. And I am the originator of the 2012 alignment theory uh, that you know, goes back to uh, an article that I wrote in 1994. And I'll get into the details of that. There's uh, you know, lots to discuss with how that's defined and what that means and how the Maya themselves were thinking about this rare alignment that culminates in the years around 2012. So, you know, my work has been sort of uh, multi-tiered, and it's evolved. I've had little different areas of interest, but it's all part of the, of the search. You know, it's all part of the quest for understanding more deeply what the ancient Maya cosmology and worldview was about. You know, when you say cosmology, what does cosmology mean? It's people think, well, it's the stars or astronomy or something, but I think of cosmology in kind of a, a broader sense of it including things like spiritual teachings. It's sort of like the holistic paradigm that the Maya had in place. Uh, and because of that, I've been very interested in how you often find spiritual teachings or ideologies that are wrapped into areas that we tend to separate into scientific areas, like astronomy, for example this astronomical alignment that culminates in the years around 2012. Well, it's not just astronomy. I mean, you look at the Maya creation mythology and they had spiritual teachings that were embedded into this alignment, this convergence that's going on. And I don't shy away from talking about the spiritual teachings in the same sentence that I talk about the astronomy. And that really sort of makes me uh, uh, a ne'er-do-well to the professional Maya scholars, you know, it, it's persona non grata time or something because I'm using the S word, spiritual or something. But the thing is that if we shy away from doing that, we're missing half the story, you know, because the ancient Maya themselves had an integrated worldview. They didn't make these artificial...